Okay, so the purpose of this video is to walk through the comprehensive property module. We're going to show how it interacts with the starting model when it's first inserted, give you a little bit of guidance on the time series periodicity, as well as the financial statement impacts. So this is kind of how data entry will impact on those financial statements. Process of use will just open up the starting model, will insert a comprehensive property module. There's no forecast calculation in this, so we're actually using the amounts module. This is an interesting module in itself. So even though there's no computation associated with it, the amounts based modules are still useful in their own right. So for example, we've got plenty of clients who are wedded to estate master say as an internal process. So all of their feasibility models are still done using estate master. What they use the property planning content for is for that portfolio analysis. So they'll insert these amounts based modules and they will actually then transfer their numbers across from their feasibility models and that typically what they'll do is transfer across their operational numbers so all of those operational cash flows around construction development that kind of thing and then what they'll do is they'll use the property planning content to look at portfolio funding get that tax consolidation work done understand the three-way financials so there's still a benefit to these amounts based modules so if you are looking to perform that type of work, stick with the amounts based modules because they're very easy to transfer your existing FISO work into. With this model, we'll actually just dial this whole thing back to a single category just so it's easier to kind of see. Whilst this is the comprehensive property module, the same principles apply for the investment property modules, property development, development hold, and things like that. So the reason why I've chosen the comprehensive property is to kind of show you the whole of the moon. And those concepts will obviously still apply for the slightly simpler other property modules. Big picture, we'll just um, have a look at the infrastructure now that that module has been inserted. Now, obviously, it's inserted the module itself. Uh, so that's gone in on a standalone worksheet. Each subsection consists of a historical set of data. These are totals only and usually hidden away. So you, you can't add more instances of the historical data. By comparison, the forecast assumptions are typically category based so you can scale those up so for example if we want to have 10 rental categories for example we can either right click and insert multiple or go up to the the Medano tab and add multiple that way in terms of the sections of this comprehensive property module we've got rental property development investment properties and the property expenses themselves construction module um, it just has a single section that relates to just those construction uh, elements now you'll notice that in terms of use, we've got blue assumption cells in this particular property model. Uh, you can change this theme very easily by just heading up to the options on the Medano tab. You'll also notice we use a lot of conditional formatting and this is really around inactive assumptions. So at the moment, this model has two periods of historical and 10 periods of forecast data. And so what that means is rather than people entering numbers and struggling to understand why they're not having an impact on the outputs, we actually use conditional formatting just to indicate, wait a minute, at the moment, these are the assumptions that are having an impact on the model. So let's just enter, we'll enter a couple of periods of historical rental income and we'll add in 10 periods of forecast rental income and just see how that impacts on the rest of the starting modules. If we head across to the historical worksheet, you'll see that we've got two columns of historical data, so nothing too complex there. If we head across to the financials, you'll see that we've actually got stitched together two periods of historical and 10 lines of forecast rental. Thing to note here is that even though we've got 10 lines of underlying rental income, we only present the total on our financial statements. And that's because a lot of modeling or good modeling anyways is all around giving the specific lens to look through. So the purpose of looking at your income statement is through an income statement lens adding too much rental information would just add more noise and kind of detract from the purpose of that income statement, which is to kind of get your head around performance, particularly in respect of the property planning content. This is really aimed at aggregation of operational information, a consolidation portfolio piece of analysis. And if we included all rental lines from all properties, the result will be a disaster. So what you see in the financial statements is one or sometimes a couple of lines for each of the individual properties. Next thing we'll have a look at from an infrastructure perspective is the time side of things. So if we just head to the time worksheet, obviously full flexibility here, the two things I want to just point out quickly are two main assumptions. One is term. If you change the term assumption within the model, 
Madonna will step in and say, that's great, I'm going to stretch the model out. So here we have the model being stretched out to, say, 24 periods. Again, Madano is just handling all of that infrastructure work for you. The other key assumption, which you'll probably use more frequently than the term assumption, is the drop-down box that relates to the last historical month. This informs the model of what is historical versus forecast information. So now let's just assume we've got, say, March information. Change the drop-down box. A few things will happen within this model. If we hop across to the historicals, you'll see that a new period has been added that's looking for data relating to those historical items. If we hop across to the individual property modules themselves, you'll see that the conditional formatting has now been updated. And what it's basically saying is, hey, I need some new historicals for March. It's also hidden the previous March forecasts because they're no longer relevant. So if we look at our, our all periods financial statements, they're now using the historical March numbers as opposed to the previous forecasts. And this is really a, another key aspect of the content that Madano puts out. It's really kind of nailed that sliding doors from historical into forecast. If we were to insert, say, an upwards periodicity set of financials, you'd get that blended period analysis. So we've really kind of bedded down that rolling financial modeling side of things. The models just last and they become a real kind of embedded part of the business. So we're no longer typing assumptions over calculations. They've got that longevity and there's this very clear structure around these models. So now we've uh, understood the time series infrastructure as well as the global flows into the financial statements. Next thing we're going to do is actually have a look through the property planning content. So the focus here is more on the financial statement impact. And so this is this is how users can understand, I guess, the breadth of the analysis as opposed to any of the whiz bang calculations. So, for example, we'll, we'll enter numbers for rental income. Now, obviously, in reality, unless you're using something like a Cougar and again, importing your separate data into this model, you're more likely to use the comprehensive calculated rental income modules to model out rental income. The emphasis here is really just more on, on showing you the financial statement impacts. So if I'll just magically populate the rental income, we'll probably also hide the other tabs just so things are a little bit clearer. And we'll crack on running through the comprehensive planning model. We'll uh, just have a quick run through the rental income section. Uh, in terms of the historical assumptions, the rental income impacts the income statement directly, as does the lease incentive release. The lease incentives closing balance will impact your starting balance sheet as well as help derive historical cash flow. So obviously, if you've got a lease incentive balance that goes from zero to 500, there has been some sort of activity, some sort of cash flow that has created that. And that's what those historical lease incentive closing balances will do. So we derive a pretty comprehensive historical cash flow. So if you're working with, say, trial balance information, the property planning content can convert that trial balance information into a really cracking kind of historical derived cash flow. Now, from a forecast assumptions perspective, the rental income is, and, and again, this is typically calculated in other modules, but uh, in this instance, this is the gross recognized amount. So this ignores any incentives. It's just literally the gross uh, rental income. Now, in terms of the lease incentive release, this is an income statement impact. And as I say, again, this is typically calculated in terms of duration of lease and amount that's actually been entered from a fit out and rent reduction perspective related to those uh, whatever you enter as your fit out incentive as well as your rent reduction your fit out is going to be capitalized as a, an incentive balance and this will be treated as an investing cash flow by comparison your rent reduction again is still going to be capitalized this will just be treated as a reduction of cash receipts and obviously underneath there's a, a little summary that relates to the rental activity for the property Okay, so if we'll have a, a quick look through the property development side of things. So this is kind of often the nuts and bolts of any property planning model. On the dev side of things, if you're an accountant or familiar with double entry and things like that, most of these should be pretty self-explanatory. So the property development profile, that's all around capitalized development. So that's literally a cash expenditure point. Internal commissioning, we're going to have a develop and hold situation. We're looking to take our own development work and actually just transfer it out of development whip and into investment properties. And that can be done from both a historical and a forecast perspective. Fair value adjustments, this is really just increases in development whip that go through the income statement. In the first instance, it's assumed that these are uh, subject to tax as well. By comparison, a couple of lines down, the revaluation side of things will hit the balance sheet as opposed to going through that income statement. So a little bit of a differential there. Property sales, income and cash receipt. If there's any working capital differential, then it's worth obviously inserting the, the debtor module and again, getting that working capital 
kind of analysis benefit. Development release relates to the release of the capitalized WIP, the cost aspect of that through the income statement at the point of sale. Now, again, we've got amounts here with some of the other modules. We'll actually allocate that capitalized WIP balance automatically in, in line of, with the profile of sales. So that's all around just the, the COGS point hitting the P&L at the right time. Revals are covered um, and retained profit transfer. So this is really more transferring revaluation reserves across into retained profits. And this all gets around uh, distribution calculations. So what are our distributable reserves? Trying to move those revals at point of recognition across into that retained profit bucket. Uh, and again, just simple summary below just to present what's moving from here into the financial statements. So that's the property development section. The investment property section, pretty similar, to be honest, to a lot of the impacts of the property development side of things. So property sales, again, impact on the income statement. Fair value adjustments will impact on the income statement. The movement there will be netted off any historical development for cash flow derivation. So again, if, if there are balance sheet movements, okay, how do we get from all of those movements back to what the notional cash flow was in those historical periods? So fair value adjustments will do that. Development release, again, impacts income statement pretty directly. Then the two balances are obviously the investment properties themselves, as well as any revaluation reserves. So these are shown on the balance sheet. Whatever the last historical data point is will be used in the forecast numbers. But again, there's any movements there are going to be used to derive a historical cash flow. So similar in concept to the property development piece from a forecast perspective. Again, nothing too complex here. Um, your property acquisitions is treated as a cash flow, cash flow to balance sheet. Your property sales, again, that's income and cash receipt. If there's any work in capital, then obviously throw a debtors module in there as well. Fair value adjustments are just going to hit that income statement and again, get taxed as opposed to the revals, which are just a balance sheet transfer effectively. Development release is just the COGS aspect of selling a property. So whenever you sell it, you are obviously going to release the value through the P&L. And then last but not least, the retained profit transfers. So again, these are all around how do I get reval points into retained profits such that I can then sling them through my, my div or my distribution calculation. And again, just simple summary output below. So that's an overview of the, the comprehensive property module. And again, main takeaway is that this is just around financial statement impact. So I'm not looking to cover off on, on detailed whiz -bang calculations. They're covered more specifically within the help of individual modules that, that they relate to. So uh, thanks for listening.